We're in a series called Measuring the Sanctuary, and uh, let's pray. Jesus, please come and be with us today as we look into your truth as found in your sanctuary, your temple, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We got our inspiration out of our look through Revelation chapter 10, where we discovered prophecy says there will be a people in the time of the end that go through a sweet, bitter experience with the book of Daniel that rise to give a message to the whole world. And I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. Somehow the end time experience and message of God's people is going to be set in an understanding, a deep measuring, a deep study of the sanctuary, the Old Testament sanctuary. That tent in the Old Testament that uh, uh, was erected around Mount Sinai that later became Solomon's temple, that later became the temple that Jesus walked in. We've noted from Hebrews 4 verse 2 that the gospel was preached to us after the cross as well as to them given the context Mount Sinai. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So evidently, the salvation that was taught at Mount Sinai was about grace through faith, just as salvation is taught after the cross is grace through faith. There's only been one gospel, one way anybody's ever been saved, and that is the grace of God that we respond to by faith. And when we look at the Old Testament sanctuary, we find that the Old Testament is not a system of works and compliance and gifts and rituals. The Old Testament is as much about accepting the grace of God, recognizing that sin is lethal, we can't save ourselves, and the links that God is going to, to and has gone to to save us. It's all about receiving what God has for us. You remember, you cannot earn God's favor. Why? Because you already have it. It's all about God's favor for us. So looking at the sanctuary, a diagram here, a large courtyard, about 150 feet long by 75 feet. In there was the altar of sacrifice representing the cross, the labor representing cleansing. We spent a couple weeks on that. Then there's the tent, the inner sanctuary, which has the holy place with three pieces of furniture, the lampstand on the left, the table of showbread on the right, and straight ahead the altar of incense, a veil, a, a separating curtain, and the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the throne of God. We noted that God said, I want you to build a sanctuary so I can dwell in your midst. Literally, that's what it says. We also noted that in the Garden of Eden, there was something in the midst. It was the tree of life. God intended to be in our midst through the tree of life, but there was also the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the garden. And the big question in the garden is, which of the two great powers, God or the usurper, the evil one, are we going to have dwell in our midst? And what did we do at the tree of knowledge of good and evil? We threw God out of our midst. And when he brought Israel out of slavery from Egypt, he said, I want to move back into your midst. He said, I want you to pitch a tent for me right in the middle of the camp because I want to dwell in your midst. And then I want to invite you into the tent to live with me. God with us and us in him. And the sanctuary simply shows us the way home. The way from being aliens and lost to being home and saved. We spent a couple weeks looking at the altar and the labor. We noted that the altar is all about forgiveness. How many sins are nailed to the cross? Jesus died once for all. He foreknew all your sins, even the ones you haven't committed yet. You realize you'll never surprise God with the sin. You may surprise yourself that you did it again, but you'll never surprise him. He already has, knows about it. He's already taken care of it. All sin is taken care of at the cross. At the altar, you find full and complete forgiveness. Then at the labor, you find healing and cleansing. We talked a bit about that. God doesn't just want you to be a forgiven mass of wounds until Jesus comes. You know, every time we sin, whether we think it was fun or not, we are wounding ourselves in a very real way, and we're often wounding others. And so from our sins, we are full of wounds. 
And God not only wants us to be forgiven, but he wants us to be healed. He wants us to thrive, not just survive. So at the altar, you find full forgiveness. At the labor, you find cleansing and healing. At the altar, you find your salvation from guilt. At the labor, you find healing from your wounds. At the altar, you find justification, getting started with God. At the labor, you find sanctification, living life to its fullest with God. At the altar, you find freedom from condemnation. Now, the world wants you to believe that if, if you believe something is a sin and you, you say X or Y activity is a sin, what you're doing, they claim, is that you're condemning people. The, the news is, folks, we're already condemned. We're born on a sinking ship, and whether you're good or bad on the ship, you're going to be just as dead when it goes down. We live under default condemnation. It's not our fault. It's not fair. And the only thing that makes life fair is that God has given us an answer to condemnation to bring us out into life. When we point out, so when, the, when the sanctuary points out sin, it's not condemning you. It's pointing out that you are condemned. And when it points out you are condemned, you're face to face with your Savior. I mean, if you tell someone they're on a sinking ship and there's no lifeboat, that's, that's depressing. But if someone doesn't know the ship is sinking, and when you point them out that the ship is sinking, and you immediately point them to the lifeboat, that's wonderful, right? It's not wonderful the ship is sinking, but there's hope. So at the altar, we find freedom from condemnation. It's funny, the world tells you we're condemning people if we say something is a sin. No, we're pointing out that, there, that we are condemned and that in Christ there is no condemnation. Christ is the way out of condemnation. That same world that wants to tell me I shouldn't tell somebody something is sin because that's condemning them can offer me only death. They have absolutely no solution but a few thrills on your way to death. You get a few days at Disneyland and then it's the guillotine. So the secular system that blames Christians for condemning can only offer ultimate condemnation. And yet we as Christians can point out we are condemned. God's not condemning us. We're all born infected and we're going to die of it. We're born on the sinking ship. There's the lifeboat. There's the antidote. Christ is the way out of condemnation. When you come to the sanctuary, you are free of condemnation. When you come to the, uh, to the altar, you're free of condemnation. When you come to the labor, you're free of debilitation. God wants us to be healed and whole. We looked at Ephesians 2, 5, and 6, where it says God made us alive together. That's at the altar. We move from life to death. Then he, God raised us together. That doesn't mean raised from life. It means raised from the sick bed. We're brought to life, and we're raised to life at its fullness. That's at the labor. And then we get to number three, move into God's living room. God sat us in the heavenlies together. So there's the good news. The way home is through forgiveness and cleansing, and we get to move into God's living room where he always leaves the light on for us, the table is always set for the meal, and the conversation is always going on, and though you can't see God, you can talk through a curtain, open communication. That's the picture of the sanctuary. Now, I want to remind you of something, because this seems to be a ditch we fall into. If cleansing is necessary for salvation, not just forgiveness, then how cleansed do I have to be before I'm saved? Wrong question. You're never more saved than you are at the altar. You just get to live out what it means to be saved. You're never more alive than the day you came to life, but now that you're alive, you get to live life. You're never more married than the day you got married, but now that you're married, you get to live marriage. You're never more saved than the day you got saved, but now you get to live saved. Does that make sense? We come to the sanctuary and we find assurance. We find security. We find that we get to live now in Christ as if we're already in heaven, even though our feet are still stuck on this wounded, bleeding 
planet. And God does it all. He makes us alive. He raises us up and heals us. Remember, it says if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to what? Forgive us and to cleanse us. It doesn't say he forgives us and then helps to cleanse us. It doesn't say he forgives us and then whatever cleansing we can't, you know, uh, he, he cleanses the parts we can't reach. No. He forgives, he cleans, he glorifies. And living in the, God's living room in the holy place is what I like to call pre-glorification. <laughs> I get to experience some glorification now before the full thing at the second coming of Christ. God does it all. The sanctuary points out our sin at the same time it points out our Savior. Remember, God is our Savior, not just Jesus. Jesus does not save us from what God's going to do to us because we sinned. Jesus is God saving us from sin and what it's doing to us. <clears throat> Therefore, I love this verse from Peter speaking before the Sanhedrin, nor is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And what is that name? That's the name of Jesus Christ, Jesus Messiah. Who's the sacrifice at the altar? Jesus, Messiah. Who's the cleanser at the labor? Jesus, Messiah. Who's the priest ministering? Jesus, the Messiah. Who's the light? Jesus, the Messiah. Who's the bread? Jesus, the Messiah. Who's the intercessor? Jesus, the Messiah. This is all about coming home to Jesus. So the last time we were together, we talked about the lights, that menorah, that lampstand made of a talent of solid gold, hammered out as a single piece. And on top of each of those seven branches, they would set a little lamp, a little golden bowl with a wick coming out and light those lamps. And every evening the lamps were lit and all the time that it was dark in the world, it was light in God's living room. And the lamps were to burn continually there's always light. And who is that light? Jesus is the light of the world. In him was life, and that life was the light of men, and the light is shining in the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it. That's a, that's a verse that's almost impossible to translate. It could mean one of two things, and the scholars argue over it, and I don't think it's been solved. The darkness did not comprehend it, could mean the darkness did not overcome the light. Have you noticed that light always overcomes the dark? There can't be dark enough dark that can put out light. Light always conquers dark. The other meaning of that verse could be the darkness tried to resist the light. And oh, isn't that true? The darkness of this world has tried to resist the light of Jesus Christ. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came as a witness to bear witness of the light, that through him, the light, all might believe. He, John, was not that light, but was sent to bear witness to the light. John was to point to the light. That was the true light. That's Jesus who gives light to every person coming into the world. Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If we follow Jesus through the altar, through the labor, and move into his living room, we'll never again be in the dark. I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. That means we abide in lightness, <laughs> in light. And yet Jesus said, you are the light of the world. So is Jesus the light of the world, or are we the light of the world? Yes. But how do we shine? I don't have any shine of myself. I have no shine. You have no shine. So if we're going to be the light of the world, we've got to be full of the light of the world. <laughs> and if we're full of the light of the world, we become the light of the world. And I like the metaphor we closed with last time. Revelation 1. I turned, John says, to see the voice that spoke with me, and turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. Not a seven-branched lampstand, but seven lampstands. 
and yet the metaphor is clear. This is sanctuary imagery. In the midst of the lamp stands one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. That's Jesus. If you read the whole context, that's Jesus dressed as a high priest, ministering in the sanctuary among his people, the church. Because it says in verse 20, the seven lampstands are the seven churches, or the total church. Now, what is the church? Or better yet, who is the church? The church is not a what, the church is a who. Remember, in the New Testament, the church always refers to people, not buildings or events. We say, I'm going to the church to go to church with the church. I'm going to the building to go to a worship event with the people. The people is the only thing identified in the Bible as church. So the seven lampstands represent God's people. Now, what does a lampstand do? It holds up a light. You don't put it under a bushel, you put it on a stand so it gives light. So who's the light we're holding up? The only way we're the light of the world is when we're a lampstand holding up the light of the world for the world to see, amen? And that's what I want us to do is simply uplift Jesus. What's the best way to uplift Jesus? with a transformed life. I've told you over and over again, we'll go through it once more. There are two reasons God wants you to be transformed. And none of them are so that you're good enough to be saved. You never will be. The two reasons are, number one, he wants you to thrive, not just survive. None of you want your children to just barely get by. You want them to thrive. You want them to have more than you had, experience more than you did. God wants us, his children, to experience life to the max, even in a dark world. But the cool thing, second reason is, if I am experiencing life to the max, others who have been told no such life exists will see it in living color. And my life, your life, can put the lie to Satan's propaganda that there is no other life than a few thrills on the way to death. We need to be the living testimony that life happens with Jesus. And so we are to hold up the light. I'm not the light of the world, Jesus is, but I get to hold him up for people to see, amen? That's the light. Now today, we want to look to the right. When we enter the sanctuary and we look to the left, we see the lampstand. When we look to the right, we see the table of showbread. You shall make a table of acacia wood. Two cubits shall be its length and a cubit its width and a cubit and a half its height. Well, you figure that out. It's a table. It's only about three feet long and a foot and a half wide and about 28 inches high, just like a normal table. This is a really small, but remember, they had to carry this thing around. And it wasn't made lightweight. It was wood, and it was overlaid with pure gold. This thing had some weight to it. You shall overlay it with pure gold and make a molding of gold around it. You shall make for it a frame, a, a hand breadth all around, and you shall make a gold molding for the frame all around. So there was um, gold covered. There was a gold, some kind of a gold border. Um, there's some weight here. You shall make four rings of gold, put it on the corners for the legs. The rings will be close to the frame, holders for the poles. To bear the table, you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold that the table may be carried by them. So evidently, they put two poles and one priest with a pole on each shoulder, another priest on the other end. Two priests would carry this table when they moved the camp. A golden table. By the way, everything in God's living room is solid gold or solid gold plated. The uh, lampstand was solid gold. The table is gold plated. The, the, uh, the altar of incense is gold plated. The boards that formed the walls were gold plated so that lamp would shimmer. Must have been an amazing place. Lots of gold. Build this table. And you shall make its dishes, its pans, its pitchers, and its bowls for pouring. You shall make them of pure gold. 
Now, why would a table with bread on it need pitchers and bowls and things? I don't know, maybe all the accoutrements that they used to make the bread were also gold, right? Mixing bowls and pouring things. And you shall set the showbread on the table before it. Now, we have this word showbread. And the word showbread kind of camouflages all kinds of interesting Hebrew words. Here, the word showbread is lehem panim. Lehem means bread. Now, what word comes to mind when I say lehem? Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem, which means the house of bread. Okay? So I don't know how Bethlehem got started, but somebody must have been a good baker and people moved in. All right? The house of bread. So lehem is bread, and panim is plural, faces. So this is the bread of faces. If you study the Hebrew, you'll discover that the face is the word they use for presence. If you're in God's presence, you're before his face. And if I'm in your face, I'm in your presence, right? Okay? So that's kind of how we use it. So this is the bread of faces. This is the bread of presence. This bread is all about the presence of God. There for us, daily food. And it says the table, the showbread, or the, the bread of the presence will be on the table before me always. The word always is tamid. We're going to discover that that word tamid is used for all kinds of things in the sanctuary. The altar and the sacrifices, the lights on the candlestick, the bread on the table, the incense on the altar, the work of the priest, all of those are said to be tamid, which means constant, ongoing, without a break. The point is, if you need light, if you need food, if you need the priest, if you need the sacrifice, you don't have to wait for some special festival, some special day, you don't have to bring some special offering. The things necessary for our salvation, forgiveness, cleansing, food, light, prayer, are always, always available. That's what it means, tamid. All right? Another verse on the table of showbread. You shall take fine flour and bake 12 cakes with it. Two-tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake. Now, the word for cake is the word halal, which has to do with perforated. It appears that all of the um, food offerings in the sanctuary were unleavened. So this is most likely, although the Bible doesn't tell us these are unleavened bread cakes, it's most likely unleavened. Now, I remember when my mom... Uh, my dad was pastoring and mom got to make the communion bread. And I'm a little kid, I was first, second, third grade, I remember she's, she rolled out this flat dough, no leavening, and then she scored it with a knife to make it into little squares. And then she took a fork and poked a thousand holes. And I said, why are you poking holes in it? Well, because those holes help it to bake evenly through. And that seems to be what this word cake deals with, is it's a, it's a flat, round bread perforated with holes. Now, the other interesting thing is you're to make each cake is two-tenths of an ephah of flour. That is four quarts. That's a lot of flour in each. These were big cakes. These were big tortillas, you know. These were more like big sopes. They were thick and unleavened, and, but they were big. They had to be, to each have two-tenths of an ephah. Now it says you shall set them in two rows, six in a row, on the pure gold table before the Lord. Now if you have a table that's only three foot long and a foot and a half wide, and you have 12 big round flatbreads, there's no way you're going to line them up in two rows. And the word for row there is uh, ma'araket, which has to do with setting things in order. When you set in a ray for a battle, you put the army in order. It doesn't necessarily mean whether it rows this way or that way or whatever way. It's getting things in order. So it appears that most likely this order was two stacks of six each on the table because there wouldn't be room for horizontal rows, only vertical rows. 
And you shall put pure incense on each row, sprinkle some on top of each stack of six, that it may be on the bread for a memorial, an offering made by fire to the Lord. And if we kept reading, we would discover that after the bread's been on the table for a week, the priest got to eat it. <laughs> That's some pretty old bread by then, right? It's on there for a week, and then they eat it, and evidently they dumped, it says an offering made by fire, they would pour that frankincense onto the altar of incense, and it would incense up while they would eat their week-old bread. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord, tamed, continually. The bread's there continually. Being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. So when was the bread set out fresh? Sabbath. What's the best day of the week? Sabbath. Sabbath is the holiday, the holy day. Everything looked forward to the Sabbath. The, the, the days of the week were even called the first of the Sabbath, the second of the Sabbath, third, fourth, fifth, sixth of the Sabbath. Sabbath. You know, it's like 12 days till Christmas, 11 days till Christmas. It's not about that day. It's about Christmas. And Sabbath is said to be the day when you'll ride on the highest places of the earth. Sabbath is said to be the day when you eat the fat and drink the sweet, which is to have the best, the best. And the fresh, the bread was freshest on the Sabbath. I think it all is symbolic of there's, there's something special available from God on the Sabbath. There's a closeness, there's a sweetness. I remember one evangelist used to line up seven glasses of water to illustrate the Sabbath. And he'd say, now, which one of those glasses will quench your thirst the best? Anyone. And then he would ceremonially cut a lemon and get a squeezer and squeeze some lemon into the seventh one and he put in a couple teaspoons of sugar and he'd stir it up and he'd say now if you want to quench your thirst which one is the sweetest the seventh one god blessed and god hallowed he added lemon and sugar and made it the sweetest and the sabbath is the day the bread is the freshest the best it's all symbolic of jesus and our relationship with him one more verse. On the table of showbread, they shall spread a blue cloth and put on it the dishes, the pans, the bowls, and the pitchers for pouring, and the showbread shall be on it. This is talking about when they packed up to move. When they packed up to move, they were to leave the showbread on the table and put a blue cloth and pile on the pitchers and the bowls, all that golden stuff, and then they had other coverings, and they put the, put the uh, poles through, and the priests would carry it. The showbread was still on the table when they were transporting it. There was always food on the table in God's house. Amen? Even when God's house was on the move, there was still always food on the table. Now, the words get interesting here. The, the Hebrew for table of showbread is sohan hapanim in this place, which means the table of the faces. So you have the bread of the faces on the table of the faces. This is all about the presence of God. Um, and the word for showbread here is not uh, bread of the faces. It's lehem ha tamid. Ha is the definite article, the. It's bread of the constant, bread of the continual, of the regular, the bread that's always there, sitting on the table of the presence of God. So we've run across some interesting words. Lehem for bread, panim for faces or present, ma'araket for row or order, tamid for continual, and sulhan for table. And if you read all the different passages, and I won't identify all of them here, it would take too long, you discover these get used in all sorts of ways. In one place, the bread is called the lehem panim, the bread of the faces. In another places, place, it's called lehem ha-tamid, the bread of the continual. In an, whoops, sorry about that. Let's get back where we were. I got too active. I have no idea where we are now. Let's try this once more. This was going to be exciting. You have the bread of the presence, you have the bread of the continual, you have the, the lehem hamaraket, the bread of the rose, they call it in another place in the Bible. Another place, um, it's called uh, the row of the continual, the ma'araket tamid. 
And then you get down to the table. One place is called the table of the rows. Another place is called the table of the faces. So this is all about the table with the bread of the presence that's always there, neatly stacked. All right. So what is the bread all about, or should we say who is the bread all about? I think Jesus was pretty clear. He fed 5,000 people one day with the sack lunch, and then he sent them home. The next day they came looking for him, and he said, I'm going to tell you why you're looking for me. You ate the loaves and were filled. You want another meal. Don't just work on physical food. Work on eternal food that I'll give you. And they worked around various questions, and they kept coming back to feed us. And they said to him, what sign will you give us that we may see and believe in you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven. Do you get the point here? He says, you need to trust in me. Well, what are you going to do to, to give us evidence to trust? Well, what did he do the day before? He healed all their diseases and he fed them from a sack lunch. What more do they need? They want breakfast. Come on, show us one more sign. How about manna? Can we have some food? Have you noticed some people will do anything as long as you feed them? <laughs> Life is more than food. God has something bigger for us than just another meal here. He's got eternity. Amen? Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my Father is giving, present tense now, you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who come, is coming down from heaven and is giving life to the world. Jesus is talking about himself. Then they said, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. And they argued some more about breakfast. And the Jews complained because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is it this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it that he says, I have come down from heaven? And finally, Jesus says, assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, trusts in me, has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they're dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat and not die. What is Jesus saying? I am better than the manna. You want breakfast, I want to give you more than breakfast. You want manna, I want to give you more than manna. I want to give you myself, and if you have me, you have everything. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live how long? Forever. The bread that I will give is my flesh that I'll give for the life of the world. And they quarrel amongst themselves, saying, this man, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? We don't eat pigs, much less people. Jesus said, assuredly, mark my words, I'm telling you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That's pretty exclusive, isn't it? There's only one way to life, and that's Jesus. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. My flesh is food indeed, my blood is drink indeed. He's the true food and the true drink, which means everything else is a false food and drink. It won't give you life. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not that your fathers ate the manna and are dead. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Jesus says if we eat him, we're in. We're going to come up in the right resurrection. We have eternal life. We have life that will never end. We will abide. Now, don't miss that. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, what? Abides in me and I in him. How do we abide in Jesus? By eating and drinking him, which is a metaphor like eating the little book for taking Jesus into our hearts and minds. And if we do that, it says we're abiding and we'll live forever and we'll come up in the right resurrection and we can't lose. That's pretty good. Abiding is everything. 
Jesus said, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean, literally pruned, because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. What's the recurring word in that passage? Abide, 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 abide. Now I want to show you, abiding is everything. First of all, verse 4 says, abide in me. That's the only thing we're told to do in this passage, is to abide. Eat Jesus. Because if you're eating and drinking Jesus, Jesus said, you are abiding in him. If we're taking Jesus into us like we take a meal, if we have a daily meal of Jesus, just like we need a daily meal of food, we're abiding. Abide in me. What happens to abiders? Verse 5. He who abides in me bears much fruit. It doesn't say he who abides in me will try to bear fruit. It says he who abides in me will bear fruit. Have you ever seen a fruit tree trying to produce fruit? No. They just, it comes natural. If the water and the nutrients are there and the roots are down and the tree is healthy, funny thing, fruit comes. A fruit tree does not bear fruit in order to be a fruit tree. A fruit tree bears fruit because it is a fruit tree. Jesus said, if your roots are down by the rivers of water, you will bear fruit in your season. You're not going to be straining to bear fruit. Fruit will be the most natural thing that can happen to a healthy fruit tree. So if you abide, what's the guarantee? The good fruit will come. All right? Up to verse 2. What's guaranteed if you're bearing fruit? Every branch that bears fruit, he, the vine dresser, prunes that it may bear more fruit. So in the Christian life, as we have been forgiven at the altar and we go to the labor to be cleansed and healed, God wants to do two things. He wants to get on with the good fruit and he wants to get off with the dead stuff. Please notice, God does not just want to make you a non-sinner. Non-sinners are just boring. Some of us think the Christian life is mostly about all the things we stop doing. No, the only reason things get stopped doing is because they're hurting us. And we need to start doing the good stuff. But if we abide, the good stuff will happen and the bad stuff will be taken away by the vine dresser. I don't need to try to prune you. You don't need to try to prune me. We don't even need to try to prune ourselves. We need to abide in what happens. Fruit and pruning. So that's why I say abiding is everything. And Jesus says, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you're abiding. So if I take time for a daily meal of Jesus, what's going to happen? Guaranteed, the good stuff will come and the bad stuff will get clipped off. And I don't need to worry about either one. I focus on abiding. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You trust in God, be trusting in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. How many of you are looking forward to a mansion? You're smart enough to most of you not raise your hand now because I'm going to tell you there are no mansions. The word mansion is the Greek word for abode. It's simply the verb abide in a noun form. In my Father's house are many abodes. Where do abiders go? To an abode. And the only way you're going to go to a abode if you're an abider. You got that? What's heaven about? Moving into full time, face to face, abiding. Now we abide across a curtain. God's a little too light for us. We've still got some darkness, right? So he veils himself. We abide in his presence. We abide in his living room now, where we have food and light and conversation. We have the presence of God, but not face to face. But Jesus says, I'm going to build abiding places in the Father's house for you. 
not the temple that is the likeness of his house, but the real house. And then, I, if, if it weren't so, I would have told you. I'm not lying to you. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare that place, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. Permanent, forever, face-to-face, -face, abiding. It's all about abiding. Jesus is the bread. They were eating the Last Supper. Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, he gave it to the disciples and said, this, take, eat, this is my body. Eat me. Luke adds, my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus says, I've given you my body as food. The bread represents Jesus. And if we're eating the bread, what is the guarantee? He says, I'm the bread of life. This is the bread that came down from heaven that one may eat and not die. We actually, folks, have an option in this world of not dying. The world can only offer you death. Jesus says, you don't have to die. If you eat this bread that came down from heaven, you'll live forever. He says, unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man, you have no life. There's no other bread. There's no other table. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life now. Even though our feet are still on this broken planet, we are already seated in heavenly places in God's living room. And though you may die, you'll come up in the resurrection. Death will be but a hiccup, a moment, and you'll be back into abiding forever. My flesh is the true food. My blood is the true drink. That means everything else is false. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood is abiding in me. Eat Jesus daily. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not as our fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. God has no intention of you going through life insecure. God does not use insecurity as a kicker to try to motivate you into better behavior. God actually uses security. He invites you through total forgiveness, complete healing, to go into his presence where you have lasting forever daily light, you have the food, you have the conversation, you have the presence of God. And if you are living in the presence of God, you cannot help but be transformed. It's all about abiding. And the outcome is guaranteed. Being confident of this very thing. Did you grow up as a Christian confident or worried? God wants us to be confident about what? This very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but when I look at myself and my bad habits and my issues and my insecurities and my problems, I would have to say there's no way God can solve all that before he comes. I'm going to need to live to be at least 1,000 or 10,000 years for him to be able to work through my issues. And you know what? If you start wondering how you're going to be ready, You've taken your eyes off of Jesus and put it on yourself, and there's no salvation in yourself. I don't have a clue how he's going to have any of us ready. And I'm not going to try to come up with a theology to figure it out. That's just going to get us all depressed and insecure. I have to trust. Salvation is by trust that he said, you let me start, I'll finish that's all I have to do is start my day with a meal of Jesus. Let him start and he will finish. Abiders will end up in the eternal abode. And to abide is to take in Jesus daily. Now in many ways I'm preaching this sermon to myself. I'm 63, I've been walking with Jesus all my life and I still find the most difficult decision of every day to get up and have a meal of Jesus. That has never, never become an automatic habit. I think Satan makes sure of that. And my personality aids in it, I think. So I want to encourage you. Mingle with Jesus in the morning. <laughs> start your day. Let him start 
a work. And be confident that whatever happens, you've turned it over to him. If it's going to get done, it's going to have to be him, not you. So let him go for it. And he says, trust me, I'll finish. Amen? Jesus, would you please tomorrow morning remind us first thing when we open our eyes and wake up that we need to grab a spiritual breakfast. Not just a moment, but some time to read and pray and meditate, think. Soak in your presence. Slip into the bath of the laver and let some healing happen. Would you remind us of that so that we can start each day with the confidence that having let you begun a good work, you promise to bring it to completion so that we will be ready and present in the eternal abode. We pray in Jesus' name.